Welcome to the North Lakes Podcast. I'm Jeremy Oswald. In this episode, we will speak with two members of the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association because guess what? It's National Health Center Week. To acknowledge that, we are going to spend some time talking about community health centers in the state of Wisconsin and the nation. It turns out that North Lakes isn't the only one in the state. Happy National Health Center Week, everyone. Welcome to the North Lakes Podcast. It's so great to have two members of the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association with me. Um, We have Sashi Gregory and Rochelle Andre. And why don't you guys introduce yourselves and tell us what you do at, uh, we're going to just call it WIPCA from here on out, if that's all right with the two of you. Great. All right. Okay, I'll start. So as Jeremy said, I'm Sashi Gregory. Um, I am the Director of Policy and Research at WIPCA. I've been there about nine years. Um, I get to work with an awesome team of people, including Rochelle, and we do a lot of the policy work at policy analysis and really work with our external stakeholders and um, really get to know all the great things that our health centers are doing. And I'm Rochelle, just delighted to be on the podcast today. I am our Associate Director of External Relations, and I primarily handle our engagement with policymakers, legislators working on laws and rules that impact health centers and the patients that they serve, both at the state level and in Washington, D.C. So I think the big question I need to start with is, so North Lakes Community Clinic is not the only community health center in the state of Wisconsin? Shocker, but it is true. Yes, a great one, but not the only one. So what, uh, expand on that a little bit. So why, like how many are there? What do they do? Are they like North Lakes or I don't know, give a little bit more of a background about community health centers in, in Wisconsin. Love that. There are 19 community health centers in Wisconsin, also known as federally qualified health centers, and each health center is unique, but they share a lot in common. So each community health center is a nonprofit and they have a patient majority board of directors, which is really unique. To become a community health center, you need to seek approval from the federal government, and then they grant that authority if you meet certain requirements. So from those 19 community health centers in the state, there's North Lakes, which covers a lot of the northern area of the state. There's also Scenic Bluffs, which is where we are recording from today in the western area of Wisconsin that is in Cashton, Viroqua, that area in the beautiful Driftless region. There's a health center in the Madison area, and then there's six in Madison. I'm sorry, rather, there's six health centers in the Milwaukee area, another one up in the Lakeshore area, one in central Wisconsin, and then a few others scattered across the rest of the state. They are primarily really designed to provide care for people who have limited access otherwise to traditional medical systems formed out of the medical model, but a lot provide care dental, behavioral health, pharmacy services, access to medications to be affordable, and then other enabling services like interpreters, access to social services, uh, navigating insurance, those kinds of services. So we like to say when you've seen one health center, you've seen one health center because they're each individual adapting to the exact needs that that community has based on, you know, what other providers in their area, what other health systems exist. So really becoming part of that safety net to provide care for patients, but there are 19 across the whole state. Yeah. And the, the 19 also have, you know, various service sites as well. So I think, uh, your health center North Lakes has like the most service sites at about 19 across the Northern part. And then, um, this you is know, being recorded in July of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, across Wisconsin, all health centers all together serve over 287,000 patients. So, you know, nice big number of folks who are at patient uh, at health centers. Um, and as Rochelle said before, and that's not individual visits. That's two hundred. That's a patient. Patients, people. yeah. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah, and and then the visits. Uh, you know, you just mentioned that um, in 2023, it was 1.1 million visits. Um, across all 19 health centers. And so, um, you know, most of the visits uh, are, you know, in the medical space. As Rochelle said, you know, there's all different types of services. Um, And then coming in in a close second is dental visits. So Wisconsin's really unique. Almost every single one of our health centers provides dental care. Um, 
And then um, mental health and SUD services are kind of like the next big one. And this has really been a big development over the last 10 years and kind of continues to grow. Will you share what SUD is? Oh, sure. Of course. SUD, um, substance use disorder treatment. I think we may call it recovery at North Lakes. And I think you're right. I think that's been the movement is to call it recovery services. Right. So we're still learning it's as things change. That one thing about healthcare, right? Just like we have our own vernacular. Yeah. That vocabulary. Too many acronyms, too. Yes. Too many to count. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I'm shocked at all. First of all, to learn that there's other community health. Mm. I'm not. I, I'm going to play that. I like. I, I'm. I, I'm like a softball pitcher. So <laughs> that's what I feel my my role is. But so, what is WIPCA's role with all of these various um, community health centers? So WIPCA is the association for those 19 health centers in the state. And I should mention there. Um, all of these clinics are federally qualified health centers, but there are two lookalikes in particular, and lookalikes are just like other health centers that you know provide the same types of services, provide services on a sliding fee scale to folks who are either uninsured or underinsured, which is something North Lakes does, and all of the other health centers do too. Um, but those two lookalikes are a little bit different in that they don't receive a, a federal grant. Um, so I just want to mention that. But um, WIPCO, we provide training and technical assistance as well as policy and advocacy support to those 19 nonprofits. So that could be improving quality outcomes in the clinical space or helping health centers implement um, electronic health records like an EPIC system, figure out how to do that well. And then our team does a lot of that public policy work. Because so many of the the public insurance programs like Medicaid, or you might know it as Badger Care, are really important and impact the way that patients receive care and that the ways that health centers operate. So WIPCA is there to provide some of that infrastructure and the advocacy and support with our federal and state agency partners, with legislators, and with folks who are making decisions that impact the way that health centers can provide the excellent care that they do. Hmm. So we have about uh, 15 staff and we have folks that are working in a lot of different areas. So we even have folks that are doing emergency preparedness training or helping health centers figure out how to do remote uh, blood pressure monitoring for their patients or figuring out how to optimize your telehealth platform. So we try to help that um, so that we can scale and spread and share best practices or promising practices. communicate about grant opportunities or partnership or or programming opportunities that health centers want to be aware of. So we're that association that can also make connections from one community health center in the state to another, like North Lakes, to, um, for example, Lake Superior that's located nearby. We can help maybe form those bridges so that people can learn from each other who are in similar roles or who want to learn about a program happening one place and try it where they're located. Yeah. One of the big kind of services we provide are spaces for health center staff to get together. We call them peer learning networks. And so we have numerous peer learning networks that kind of run the gamut in terms of um, people who are working in finance or people who are working on advocacy or communications. And um, these are great um, venues for people in similar roles to just, you know, support each other in those roles. And as Rochelle said, kind of find out best practices and kind of other ways that they can, um, you know, build services and things together. So, so somebody doesn't need to reinvent the wheel, you know, like like if North Lakes is, and what what I love about it is that like, it's not just one thing, you know, personally, uh, it touches me in my marketing and advocacy, but I also know that in our finance department, they have a whole other thing where like the, the finance teams at different um, health centers get together and talk about how they do things. And exactly. that's got to be super helpful. It, it's a really beautiful part of being um, a part of the health center family is that there's a lot of interest in sharing what's working and learning from each other's you know lessons or opportunities so that we're all really... Um, sharing together in that health center family to advance, you know, the the work that's going to benefit patients, that's going to benefit health centers in the long term. That's really beautiful. Do you have an example of where that's happened? Absolutely. So I'm thinking 
about telehealth in particular. So there was a lot of work during the pandemic to quickly roll out telehealth, but there are so many different platforms and technology resources and different ways and, you know, different workflows. Like, do you pick up the phone first? Do you get a Zoom link? How does this work? So we brought folks together um, pretty early in the onset of COVID to learn together and figure out, well, we don't really like that platform. It doesn't have the connections to our electronic health records that would be good, or it's really confusing for providers or patients to navigate. So we created those forums so that health center staff can can share that more directly to each other and avoid recreating the wheel, as you say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another a great example we have is that, um, you know, health centers have started um, in doing integrated care with behavioral health and mental health and um, medical care. And that's a place where they have really had to learn from each other on how to kind of have those systems in place, what kind of providers they need, what kind of training they need. And so there's been just great um, kind of working together and visiting each other too. So I think that's one nice thing. You can kind of visit a health center and kind of see how they're doing their work and they're not hiding it, right? They're, they really want to show and they're proud of that work and they want to make sure that other people can learn from them. So that's been great. Yeah. It's not like one healthcare center is competing it against another. We're all kind of have the same overall goals. So yeah, how cool. Like, yeah, let me like, yeah, this is how we did it. Check it out. And I think that really speaks to the mission that health center staff and the mission that health centers have is really that shared vision that people are are seeing high quality outcomes and and really getting that access to care that they need. And and health centers don't, um, you know, protect that information. They they share that mission. So they they really want to spread that. And and that's, I think, pretty special. And there's not a community health center that isn't connected with you guys. There's not one that's like, no, we'd rather not. Correct. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty pleased. All of those 19 community health centers in the state are involved with WIPCA and, you know, we're kind of here to meet health centers where they're at. So whether they're really interested in working on, you know, diabetes and hypertension, or if that's not really their focus, we won't work with them on that thing. We might have some shared priorities together, but we, we try to be that glue that can make connections or um, scale like we talked about before, what's working and what's not, but all of those 19 health centers in the state are connected with WIPCA. We do often get confused um, relative to free clinics. So we always like to share with the public that WIPCA is not the association for free clinics. There is a different association, the Wisconsin Association of Free and Charitable Clinics. And there's uh, many, many free and charitable clinics in the state. And some of those free and charitable clinics have even become community health centers in the last few years. So those two lookalikes we have in the state, which are Rock River Community Health Center and Muslim Community Health Center. They used to be free clinics and are now community health centers. And really, again, shared mission across a lot of those entities, but we're specifically the association for those 19 community health centers. And anyone who is a staff person at a community health center is a member of our organization by default. So you don't need to pay a membership fee to access our resources or anything like that. You're automatically a member. And and we do have a website with lots of resources and materials for health center staff, as well as those peer learning networks, which we really use as maybe our our front door to access and share resources. We do that through the peer learning networks of individuals with shared roles, like chief medical officers will meet up um, regularly as will pharmacy staff or behavioral health leaders to learn how to do behavioral health integrations. Well, we even have staff that meet up regularly around billing and coding so that they can learn from each other. Cause there's a lot of things that are unique to health centers in that space. So we try to provide those venues for those staff with similar experiences to, to share with each other. I, I, one thing I love about doing this podcast, well, I love and hate it is that I have now so many questions and I don't even know which direction to go in, but here's one I just want to do real quick just to give people a a, a broader view that community health centers don't exist merely in the state of Wisconsin. They're nationwide. Mm -hmm. Um, Correct. You can back me up on that one. Yes. There are about 1400 
community health centers across the nation. And they were actually started in the 1960s out of the civil rights movement and have evolved a lot since then, but they exist in every state and territory in the U.S. So the first were in Mississippi, I believe, and maybe Boston, I think. Sounds right. So yeah, those were the first two. Yeah. (laughs) Grown a lot since then. But one thing I do not know is does each state have an association similar to WIPCA's in it? Yes. So WIPCA is a primary care association, and that is kind of a specific thing. Each state has a primary care association, which is really tasked with providing that training and technical assistance that we talked about. But some are regional. So for example, the Dakotas have one shared primary care association among them. But essentially, we we're really that connector of the umbrella in those states to to form that infrastructure for the health centers to connect in that state or region. Yeah, and, and we do get federal funding. So we get what we call our primary care association grant. And through that funding, um, you know, that really supports a lot of the tra- training and technical assistance that we do with health centers. And we're a nonprofit just like each of the community health centers is too. And you're based in Madison. We are. Is it typical that a, um association will be based at the, in the state capitol? I don't think that's unusual and um, there it's not unusual at all because like we said, you know, not only do we do kind of training and technical assistance, but we have a, you know, fairly big arm that does advocacy and uh, policy work. And so being close to a state capital kind of helps with that. But I know, for example, in Illinois, there's staff in Springfield, which is the capital, but a lot of their health centers are in Chicago. So a lot of the staff for the primary care association, I believe is also based out of the Chicago area. So here at WIPCO, we have staff too that are located in different areas and um, they don't have, you know, from our organization, not everyone works out of Madison. Yeah. And sometimes the state has so many health centers and is so large. So California has more than one primary care association kind of serving across the state. So that's fun to hear that each state has its own association, but there's also a, a federal one, like kind of that oversees the whole nation. There is a federal association of community health centers and of primary care associations like WIPCA. That association is called the National Association of Community Health Centers. Very creative name. Um, Big shocker there. So we call them NAC. And NAC does, they have a lot of forums for different type of efforts. I know that they have data on how many patients were served at health centers last year. And I know that they hit an all-time high, so I'm going to try to look that up if I can. Or you keep talking and I'll look it up. Okay. Yeah. That's an even better plan. But they um, they do a lot of quality improvement work. They're also really looking at ways to transform the way that health centers operate in the value-based care space. So there's a lot of energy that's been around for the last few decades, but as you know, the cost of healthcare continues to rise. There's certainly interest in figuring out how to bend that cost curve, how to really pay for value. We know that health centers provide very great value for the dollar. So I've seen statistics and in, um, in lots of different studies that show a one dollar investment in health centers has anywhere from a three to a six dollar um, return on that investment based on the economic impact and on the value and on the health for patients. Um, So NAC does a lot of that work in the value transformation space. So like care models, who's really delivering that care and how are they doing it? Is it nurse practitioners? It is is a a physician led model. Is it a team based model? How can we really treat chronic diseases best, um, you know, from the get go to keep people from getting sick? later on. So they do a lot of that kind of work. NAC is also extremely involved in any federal issues, especially federal funding. Um, Every year, Congress is supposed to pass an appropriation bill that has funding for community health centers in it. We do a lot of advocacy around that appropriation bill, as well as the other funding streams for health centers, which, you know, I have to say never fully cover the, the cost of providing care at community health centers because of the wide range of work that you all do um, that's uncompensated. But those federal dollars 
pay for a portion of that care for people who are uninsured and for those services that there really isn't a payer for. So NAC does a lot of work on those federal priorities, the federal legislation efforts that Congress is involved in and, and regulatory issues, because there's a lot of regulations around health care and little changes can sometimes have really big impacts. I, I love the big picture. I do want to bring it back, but I do want to get back to that because I've got crazy thoughts going through my head, some oh. questions <laughs> that I didn't even think I'd ever ask you. But um, let's let's get back to like the kind of like the individual healthcare center just for one second. How is care that is provided at a community health center different or similar um, than other health care? That's a really great question. And, and it does differ community to community. But um, when someone is receiving care at a health center, the first thing they'll probably notice is that regardless of their insurance status or their income, they have the same opportunity to get care at that health center. So whether you have Medicaid, Badger Care, or if you're commercially insured, you're welcome to get care at a community health center. Or if you're uninsured or underinsured, maybe you just have medical care, but no dental insurance. So you'll notice that all of those patients are welcome at community health centers, which is a really important part of the model. You'll also notice that those services are provided according to a sliding fee scale for people who are uninsured or underinsured, under 200% of the federal poverty level. Something else you might notice, um, some health centers do more of this than others, but often care is provided in an integrated setting. So you could maybe get multiple services at the same location or under the same roof. Sometimes those care teams like a dentist and a medical provider are in direct communication about the patient's needs, which is pretty special. I mean, I don't experience that with my own healthcare provider. My dentist would have no idea what my medical doctor thinks about my health. And often when people are experiencing a lot of um, health issues or concerns, it's really important to have that integrated team wrapping more holistically around a patient. In addition to those teams, a lot of the work that health centers do is looking at the whole health of an individual coming in through their doors. Because we recognize that an individual, someone who has a housing access issue or a food insecurity issue is probably not gonna be able to focus on taking their diabetes medication if they're worried about where they're gonna sleep next week. Or if they have so much stress and anxiety from um, you know, a childcare issue that they really can't focus on their, their cholesterol wellness. So health centers are really focused on looking at that person holistically, figuring out, you know, is there a food access program? And they may even run something like that um, that's available to patients. So again, the, the staff that meet with patients who are receiving care at health centers are, are really thinking more holistically about that patient, about their care. They might need to make referrals for that patient to see a specialist, you know, go to a hospital or, um, you know, something that's more acute might need to be seen in an urgent care setting. So not every single health need that a patient has will be covered at a health center. You know, they, they may not just provide all that care. So it's more of that preventative outpatient work, but a lot of um, that wraparound care, which is really unique to the health center setting is something we're really proud of. Yeah. And I think, you know, to build on that, it's really about um, how can health centers remove those barriers to access that so many people have. And so I think, um, you know, um, having more staff that are kind of from your community or part of your community, maybe they look like your patients, you know, is that make it more comfortable for somebody to come in and, and get the care that they need. Um, you know, many health centers, almost all health centers have to have translation services. They may even have staff who are specifically from that community who can kind of speak to that. Um, you know, I know a lot of health centers, you know, as, as mental health needs have gone up, um, have noticed like, hey, we need more bilingual counselors. We need more people who can speak the language of the folks who are, you know, needing this care. And I think they try to make that happen. And those are priorities for health centers. Like, how do we remove those barriers? How, do, how can we make sure that, you know, we can get it, people into the door, but then how do we make sure that they can actually get the care, the best quality care that they need? And really what Sashi is talking about is access in a lot of ways. So we really think about health centers as removing those barriers to access and then delivering high quality care. Um, 
So transportation barriers, often health centers will be thinking really creatively about how to bring care to patients in ways that um, is is unusual and maybe surprising. So school-based services, many health centers operate school-based clinics. There's one in Wisconsin that really looked at uh, both medical and mental health needs for young people in their community recognizing high rates of depression and suicide for their youth. And built and embedded a clinic in their local elementary school. And by looking at which elementary school had the highest rates of um, financial insecurity, they decided to host their clinic at that school. So the students with the highest needs had direct access to those, those medical and mental health options in that school. Other health centers also operate mobile programs. So they have uh, mobile units that take care around to various locations. There are also health centers that have special designations to provide care for special populations. Um, There's one health center in Wisconsin that provides a lot of care to migrant seasonal agricultural workers called Noble, which is based out of the Watoma area. Not sure if we know how many migrant seasonal agricultural worker patients they served last year. We do not have that number today. Okay, very good. Um, There are also health centers in the state. So in addition to migrant seasonal agricultural worker care, there are health centers that focus on care for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, There are also health centers that see veterans. Uh, What else? Um, It's a list that's 100 miles long. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean it that way, but I mean, it's like, look, uh, from... I love being in the room with you two because you have so much more knowledge than me. But that's not true. Not true. Uh-huh. Not true at all. Oh, and, we just get and, to see things at the statewide level, which is fun. And you're humble. <laughs> but I like I think the what you're you're emphasizing right now, which is what I appreciate working here, is that it's like it, it's 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 nonprofit. So there's trying these programs. They're doing these things. Not because it's going to be financially successful, which it might be, mm-hmm. but it's because these are the ways that we get care to people. You know, these are exactly. like that aren't. And it, it, because of the backing that we have and the things that we do, we're able to offer and try those things and do experiments like I, I you know, I know with the North Lakes, we've tried things. They just didn't work. You know, mm-hmm. it was like it was like unsuccessful, but we tried them and it and but but we have the opportunity to try And then when we're successful, we get to share it with other systems. And it's that that local need. So what's so special about health centers is that since they are local community based nonprofits, the decision making about a new service or a new delivery site is really being driven from that community. So just like North Lakes um, has adapted to open new clinics in the last few years, that's really being driven by what does that community need in particular? And what the community in um, Dodgeville needed was a dental clinic. So a health center went into that community and opened up a a dental clinic there and they didn't need medical services. So they didn't add them at that site because there wasn't so much demand. But that that has been, been really exciting to see so many creative ways to expand access based on specific community assets and opportunities where people have limited access to care. Yeah. Another great example of that is in in Milwaukee, um, a number of health centers work with the uh, Milwaukee Mental Health, um, whatever it's called, administration. Um, And, you know, crisis mental health care is really important. So they'll have a crisis um, care center embedded in a health center. So once somebody's kind of been stabilized, they can then, you know, be um, become a patient at the health center and kind of have all of their needs um, met through that once they've been kind of to that crisis piece. So, you know, I think health centers (coughs) also look to see, you know, how can we um, work with our community friends and our and our hospitals and our other things to just, you know, like we said, um, you know, increase access. Part and partnering, partner, partner, partnering, Thank you. <laughs> Part- partying, Part- partnering <laughs> with other organizations that exist. So we're not our standalone thing. We will, we'll work with anyone. Yeah. And certainly not in a vacuum. So those partnerships with a hospital or a health system or a clinic, those are all really, really important. And many health centers have have really figured out that special sauce of, of what can they do best? What can they do differently that, 
you know, for whatever reason it is, other parts of the community just haven't been able to stand up. So for example, those substance use disorder services that North Lakes does and um, recovery services. Rec- uh, that's right. Recovery services. I, just, Thank you. It's a, you know, it's not one thing. <laughs> right. right. We can but, call it everything we want. Yeah. But it does mean different things to different people too. So, mm-hmm. you know, knowing that's how North Lakes thinks about it is important. So um, a health center has a lot of um, that type of services for people experiencing um, addiction and, and who are in crisis in central Wisconsin because they really have some expertise on their staff to do that work and have gotten some state funding to do it. Another health center operates a, a community-based farm program that grows a lot of traditional foods for the Hmong community in central Wisconsin. That's probably not a need that exists in the Milwaukee area. But the Milwaukee area has a significant urban tribal population and they have an urban tribal federally qualified health center there that does a lot of uh, really culturally sensitive and responsive care specifically for tribal communities. Yeah. I think one of the things that excites me about Gerald Ignace, which is that urban Indian health center is um, they uh, during COVID, they provided um, specialty boxes for their native elders with that type of food that, um, you know, is, is locally grown and, and is part of their culture. So I think that was exciting to see how they do those specific, unique kind of programs for their patients. And, um, and did they work with other tribal health organizations just to like, uh, to tie in those cultural roots? I mean, I mean, I know like up by us, there's Red Cliff and Bad River both have their own healthcare centers. I'm just curious, like, I like, you know, like to like make that connection of like how, um, I don't you know, even know I what I'm trying to I think they make those connections across the different tribal cultures and things like that. But I think, um, this was just more specific to kind of a more general need of, of their elders that are living there. So are there common mis- misconceptions that people have about community health centers or is there something you'd like everyone to know about? I guess we just shared a lot, but what, what are like some common things that people um, kind of hang on community health centers that isn't true? So I, I do spend a lot of time introducing the concept of community health centers to individuals who have may never heard of that um, that type of clinic before. And I, I often do get questions about whether all the services are free or if you take insurance or if the, the community health center just serves a particular population. So um, community health centers do bill insurance. So if you come in with a, a, an insurance, whether that's Medicaid, like we said, Badger Care, or commercial insurance, the, the health center will bill that insurance according to the services that you received. But community health centers are not just for any particular individual or type of population. So they're open to all. Some health centers um, serve a majority, and and this is most most health centers, serve a majority population of patients who are uh, enrolled in the Medicaid program and have Medicaid insurance. So that's the, the primary funding source for community health centers is the Medicaid program. So we spend a lot of time thinking about Medicaid and how to strengthen the program and how to get people who are eligible for Medicaid enrolled in the Medicaid program as a public insurance option. Or if you're not eligible for Medicaid, health centers have people on hand who can get people enrolled or connected to different insurance options. And also health centers are not just for people who are low income. So regardless of your income, you can receive care at a community health center um, just as anyone who is enrolled in a public insurance option would. Or if you got a pocket full of cash. That'd be great too. Yeah. Come on down. That's I mean, great. you know, a barrier I think I know that I traditionally think of is usually financial, but a lot of times it's also distance, like transport. Like I'd rather go to this clinic that's two blocks from my house than have to drive 60, 100 miles to get somewhere. So it's not always just financial that's the barrier. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I often hear or I receive questions about the staffing at community health centers, whether it's like volunteers or just open like one day a week or something like that. And that's really not the case for community health centers in Wisconsin. So they're they're staffed full of employed providers and nurses and front desk staff and interpreters and care coordinators and managers. And they really provide high quality care. So it's not... um, you know, something to, to look for as a last resort. If the community health center in my neighborhood was accepting new patients, I would be getting my medical care there. Really, really high quality care. Um, so we really want to help people understand that 
health centers are a fantastic place to receive care and are a, a terrific option for lots of people in your community. I do have one kind of example I like to share is mm -hmm. that, you know, um, physicians at our clinic, you know, sometimes they need a certain day of the week off because they're in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Is that a hospitalist? Is that what that person yeah, is called? Yeah, might be so, a hospitalist, yeah. So, I mean, it's not that they're just providing care at the community health center, but they're doing it in hospitals as well. That's as true. one example. Yeah, some mm -hmm. health centers do share staff, um, or even maybe a, a dentist practices a few days a week at their own private clinic and a few days a week at the community health center. That happens a lot, too. Mm. Um, so are there any, um, you know, what do you see as like some threats or obstacles that may, that community clinics may be facing anything kind of coming up that like, Ooh, this, this could be, this might be bad for community health centers. Well, we do know that there are some really extreme workforce pressures in the healthcare environment overall, not just for community health centers, not just in Wisconsin, but nationwide. And I think that's really the primary limiting factor for health centers to expand more, serve more patients, meet more of that need for behavioral health, for dental, for medical services. There just are not enough providers of care in the industry. So that's pretty scary because there are so many people on wait lists trying to get into care. Health centers are often the only clinic in a community that will take adults or children who have Medicaid for dental care. And when a patient can't get in, they really don't have another option. And that's really, really challenging. So those workforce pressures are really top of mind. And it's not something that we can solve alone, but health centers are doing so much to be a part of that solution, hosting behavioral health students as they complete their training so they can understand the community health center model and complete their required clinical rotations, or partnering up with your local technical college that is trying to train more hygienists so that they can see what an integrated care setting looks like or have the opportunity to complete their training, their clinical rotations at that setting. So I think those workforce pressures are number one. That's also driving up a lot of salaries. It's driving up competition. It means that employees have a lot of options where to work and they, you know, are, are, are probably seeing a lot of opportunities to advance and move around and maybe earn a higher wage. All of that is, is good for the, um, you know, for your employees in a lot of ways, but it also puts the employer like the health center or even the hospital in a really challenging environment to try to retain staff when there are, is such great need that there's a lot of competition for those individuals in the workforce. I think the other thing too is just financial models for healthcare are really challenged right now. And a lot of that is, of course, we know there's been inflationary pressures over the last few years, but the cost of providing services is just continuing to grow. So we're really trying to understand what are the sustainable ways that health centers can form the foundation for long-term, you know, responsible, sustainable delivery of services in a model that's going to work long-term. Yeah. And I think what's important to also remember is that these upstream services that health centers are providing are, are really important to like not having to use all those expensive specialty services, not having patients having to go to the ER for a, a crisis thing. So if we're, you know, serving those kids at school and their mental health or their dental needs early on, you know, that's, that's a great investment. And that investment in the workforce and in those health centers really kind of helps with that, um, you know, that first place that we want to make sure that people are being taken care of before things get worse. So... Yeah, I would totally agree. There's more and more and more recognition of those social drivers of health, those factors in a person's life that really impact their health outcomes. And health centers do a lot of that work really, really well. But we're totally under investing in primary care. Our system overall spends a lot of money, a lot of resources in expensive specialty care that frankly could be avoided if we did more investment upfront in the primary care, like the care that health centers provide every day. How does that message resonate with um, politicians, with other stakeholders in the medical world, in the healthcare world? I think everyone recognizes that the cost of healthcare is too high, but there's a lot of conversation around what the different solutions are to that problem. So I don't know if there's consensus around 
you know, what to do about it. Certainly the rising cost of drugs is driving people nuts and, you know, really making people sick when you can't afford to go get your medications. Health centers are, you know, in that area, a great component of the solution because providing affordable pharmacy services is a requirement of being a health center, whether it's at your exact health center or at one of the pharmacies that you partner with. Um, But I do think that looking at value, looking at paying for what works in healthcare is something that there's a lot of interest in, but we haven't quite figured out how to do that well. Yeah. And I think as um, more individuals get affected by those prices or by um, new health issues going on, I mean, I think about recovery services or even mental health as people see that affect their family members or the people in their community, then I think there's a bigger recognition of like the importance of those needs. And I think you know, we're starting to see that sometimes, even though it's an unfortunate reason why. There's also in, in healthcare, we haven't seen it in community health centers, but there's been a lot of consolidation. There's a lot of really big systems, really big insurers, really big kind of players in there. And that's the case in Wisconsin. We've got a lot of large kind of national entities involved in delivering care in Wisconsin, and that's okay. But it means that that those decisions about care and what's happening, you know, might be made in another state way far away from where we are here in Wisconsin. So what's so cool about health centers is that since they're all these local nonprofits, it's folks here in Wisconsin who are making those decisions about where a clinic, what a service looks like, what you're adding or changing, how you're serving patients. So having those local voices involved is really excellent. But you know, we get a little nervous around the really big organizations that are, are making decisions that may be disconnected from the actual needs of patients and, and certainly financially motivated. And every single organization needs a business model that's going to work. So everyone's entitled to that. But but what's so exciting about health centers is that those, those decisions are ultimately made locally and, you know, the health center leadership and their board, which again is made up of a majority of patients, are accountable at the end of the day. I'm going to spell that out just a little bit more that so I'll just use North Lakes as an example. So we have a board of directors um, and I don't know if it, 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 it's a vast majority of those people are patients. So they have this other connection to the healthcare center, to our healthcare center, and they're the ones making the decision. So like when North Lakes wants to move into another location, it's that board of directors that is that making that decision like he has to do this. So it's not just like we're willy nilly like, oh, we're going to do this. But it is a, a group of patients that have come together who um, who direct this ship, who drive this boat. Yeah, really cool. Yeah. Very beautiful model. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that like I thank you for mentioning it because I work here and I forget that. <laughs> so that is a like a really um, good thing to share. Um, and I think it is worth mentioning. We're talking about. Um, Um, how it is hard to get providers that um, community health centers are unique or not unique, but they do have a, there's an interesting program that does pay for um, student loans for a provider. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So there are a few different programs. The big one that um, folks should be aware of is the National Health Service Corps. So this is a, a federal program that will incentivize practice in an underserved area for a certain amount of time, depending on the program. It's usually two or three years. And if you qualify for that program and practice at a community health center or some other locations in underserved areas, your your loans will be forgiven. And some of them are on the front end, you know, with uh, or, or rather some of them are upfront like scholarships and grants to practice and some are on the back end like loan forgiveness. But either way, there are some programs like that that incentivize providers to practice at health centers and other rural and underserved locations, which is pretty cool. So, um, the National Health Service Corps is the big program. There are also some st- state programs like the State Loan Assistance Program, which is administered by the Wisconsin Office of Rural Health that also provides some incentives for practice in rural areas. And these programs are really important because um, students now, like um, I, I read recently that dentists actually in the healthcare field have the highest debt to income ratio of any type of healthcare uh, provider. So the average dentist is graduating with almost $400,000 in student debt these days. It's pretty scary. And those students, you know, maybe long term, they'd be able to make those those investments back. But it's pretty hard to go work somewhere that um, 
you'd be able to make a lot more in private practice, honestly, than working in a nonprofit setting just because the numbers are different. The mission is different. Your payer mix is different. So a lot of those incentives are, are not really geared toward working in areas that are underserved or working with patients um, that have the highest need. So I, I, 400,000. That's right. It's, it's, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, we can't blame people for making decisions for their financial health when you're, you're graduating yeah. with that much debt. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to turn back to the two of you just a little bit, like what, what kind of drew you to, to this work? Like what, what make, made you motivated to work at WIPCA? Yeah, I've been, I've been at WIPCA for about four years now. I was overworking at the state health department before and did some evaluation work before that and did some numbers work. I was doing some data monkey stuff on the computer for a little while, but I wasn't quite feeling fulfilled because I felt kind of disconnected from how the work I was doing was actually benefiting anyone. I couldn't really draw any direct lines. So when I saw an opportunity at WIPCA and more of the advocacy and policy space, it felt like the right fit because I, I essentially get to work on the big picture stuff, but I know who's benefiting from that work are the individuals who are, are really deserving of that access to care, of the support that they need to be healthy. And when we make changes in the public policy space, it's not always directly, you know, I, I can't always put my finger on exactly what's going to change for a patient, but I know that those decisions are going to trickle down. So for example, something we worked on for years and years was authorizing this new type of dental provider in Wisconsin called a dental therapist. Maybe we can talk more about them in the future. But essentially, a dental therapist is someone who can um, work as part of the dental team. And we worked on this legislation for a long time because we we were really confident that it was going to help improve access to care. And these, these providers will be able to bring in more patients, see more folks once they're authorized here in the state pretty soon. And by working on that legislative task, I know that there are patients in Wisconsin who are waiting for care right now today, that once we have these providers in place, they'll be able to see someone, they'll get their oral health pain, they'll be able to get their pain resolved. They'll go home and be able to focus on school or work. So it it's really exciting to see that impact. And it's a fun mix of wonky, sort of weedsy policy stuff, plus communications work. And everything that we get to do at WIPCA is relational. So I get to work with health centers across the whole state and see all of the weird, wacky, and wild things that you're doing and help you do more of what's working, which is really fun. Hmm. I could echo very, almost all of what Rochelle has said. Um, I actually started my kind of working career after college doing federal advocacy around um, access to healthcare for women and children and um, especially moms. And so, um, and then, then went to school for my public health degree and then worked for the Michigan Medicaid director for a while. And so when I came to Wisconsin, I was really wanting to get back to kind of the clinic side to kind of the, what my, my old boss, the Medicaid director said, the good guys. <laughs> um, and I, you know, got this job where I got to once again, do that advocacy piece. And as Rochelle said, also get to do the kind of nitty gritty policy work. Um, and then I think what I have come to really love about this work is, um, working with the community health centers and like putting that their stories, their underground work with kind of that data side as well. And so um, that just really fulfills me. And, you know, to what Rochelle has also more eloquently never said, never. Um, just, you know, you get to see it more um, concretely, right, in how it's actually affecting people in communities and in communities for people who need it the most. I. I'm just, I'll kind of echo what you are both saying. I, I, I guess that I, I didn't know what a community health center was until one appeared in my town. And I'm like, what? And I, the more and more I learned about it, um, I was like, you do what in this and that? Yeah. It, it really feels like the way, the way care should work yes. <laughs> is the health center model. And people say, why don't we do this or that or that in the healthcare system? I'm like, we are, health centers are the best kept secret who are doing that work really, really effectively. Which is why I really appreciate the two of you being on here. I just think it's it's really fun to like talk just about big picture and, and policy. A lot of times I'm talking about specific things with providers that I love to do. That's really fun, but it is really neat to be like, do, 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 community <laughs> health centers. Yeah. Um, 
And so uh, with that in mind, how are, have you ever seen examples of where things like, as you were saying, this is how community, you know, um, healthcare should be provided. Have you seen other organizations that are not a community health center kind of adopt what we're doing or um, kind of take on something? Well, I think there's academic institutions who understand the importance of this, right? So, um, you know, at, at UW, there's two programs, I think Triumph and then what's the um, world are one? You talk, warm? Are you talking about the training program? Yeah, the training programs where yeah. they're trying to get people into areas where care isn't as easily received and kind of introducing them to that. So I think, you know, this understanding at the kind of provider level of um, introducing students to community health center work, which isn't always easy, right? Like you have to be scrappy if you're working at a community health center. You have to be creative. You have to be able to kind of think on your toes to get the care sometimes for people because they're, they're complicated patients. They have a lot, a lot of things going on and a lot of barriers that they're trying to, um, you know, overcome. And so, and maybe who have had a really negative experience with a healthcare provider exactly. who have never had care for 30, 40, 50 years of their lives and are just trying to get, get on their feet for the first time. Mm -hmm. mm. So, you know, I think that's something not really answering your question, but I think it's something people are recognizing in, in the, the field of educating our next providers. I mean, there are certainly plenty of organizations that are, are leaning into more integrated care. So, so for example, there's a big medical dental integration program in Wisconsin that several community health centers participate in, but so do other types of entities that might be free clinics or hospitals or health systems trying to do more integrated work, which is challenging for everyone because it's not really how our health system is set up. You know, your eyes and your ears and your head and your body are all kind of treated differently <laughs> for a lot of weird historical reasons. But health centers are trying to do that. And a lot of organizations are recognizing those social drivers of health more and more than ever before, how transportation and housing and food influences health. So many organizations are leaning in, but health centers have been doing that forever. Health centers have been, the bread and butter is looking at the whole person. It When you go to a health center, there's never just been a medical visit goodbye. There's there's always been that recognition of the need to screen for some of those components of health to really get proactively addressing them, not just wait until someone is already in crisis. Really try to look at that whole person, even look at their family and understand where the opportunities are to improve the health of a, a family of an ecosystem. So health centers are kind of at that weird in intersection between the private sector and a public health model because some of them are, are really mm -hmm. thinking, what is the health of our community going to be if we can work differently and if we can work with our partners differently? Yeah. So that's not unique to health centers, but it's something they do really, really well. Yeah, and that focus on population health, like you're saying, so important. And then I think... Um, you know, I think Rochelle touched on this before. It's it's about, and you did too, Jeremy, about, you know, trying something new, being a little bit more innovative. Um, you know, in Wisconsin, health centers were some of the first to get um, HOPE grant funding to help with recovery services and opiate use um, up in North Lakes, up in, the, in Milwaukee, in those areas. And I think they took that and then they made it work for their communities, right? And I think that's a huge testament to um, to health centers because it's not easy to bring in those programs with the stigma involved, with the um, kind of you know all the complications involved with with providing that best care. And so I think um, they're able to be um, I forgot what we call it very nimble, nimble. Thank you, yes, mm -hmm. the nimble, nimble piece, right? They're able to come in and kind of make that program work in a short amount of time. Yeah, well, and and the, it does remind me, and I, I don't want to make this like a patting North Lakes on the back, but it's okay. That's your job, Jeremy. Yeah. Okay, we, that's we, why I'm it's here. your podcast. But, yeah, <laughs> we're just but living in your world. It was a, I mean, that was a. a I remember that being a, a chance. I felt North Lakes was taking like we're going to do what, we'll, like help with recovery, like and 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 it was because at the time. I think I had kind of the the view about addiction that m many people did. It's like, what are you doing? You know, you, you just messed up your life and like, you know, like really putting like the shame and all that person. that's there. Yeah. 
and, you know, and, and feeling that around the communities that we had those programs in that there was, you know, we all look at social media and you could feel that like, you know, negativity and I don't know how many years it's been, but that's just for me. And, and then again, it is my podcast, so I know, <laughs> but, but I can feel that like washing away that we have a better understanding of what addiction is, that it is a medical issue and, um, that, you know, we took a chance and, yeah. and it's paying off and it's absolutely not cured, solved, absolutely like not at all. But I mean, there has been a barrier removed as far as like the, the some of the stigma involved with it. And yeah. So thank you for reminding me that. <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing we haven't really touched on a, a little bit about talk a little bit more about the, the financial piece, like how are community health centers funded? Yes. I really appreciate that question because sometimes when I talk with um, maybe legislators, maybe partners, they say, ah, you don't need any money. You guys are government funded. You're government entities. And that is not accurate. So health centers are nonprofits. So they are their own organizations. The majority of their funding comes through billing insurance. And for most health centers, the biggest part of that pot is Medicaid. So Medicaid is really, really important. It's a it's a huge program and it is absolutely essential. And Medicaid is very broad. Medicaid covers children, adults, individuals with long term care needs, Mm -hmm. a very wide range of people in Wisconsin. So we spend a lot of time in our advocacy and our public policy work talking about Medicaid. Of course, right now there's been a, a, a effort over the last year to redetermine eligibility for people enrolled in Badger Care. We're really looking at what that all means for health centers, sustainability Mm -hmm. and financial models in the future because it's a a really big component of their sustainability and their financial model. And health centers do receive a federal grant, but that federal grant comes nowhere near covering the cost of the care that is provided in communities. It's designed to offset a portion of that so that health centers can provide care for people who are uninsured and underinsured, which is required to be part of this national program. But health centers do not get reimbursed for everything that they do. They, They take a loss on many of the services that are not reimbursable. If they're running a food box program, there's, there's no direct funding stream for that. They're probably using a grant, maybe some community donations, but it's mostly billing those, those programs, those insurers. They get that federal grant. There's also different revenue from other sources like community-based foundations or individuals. Mm-hmm. There's other federal funding programs, but with more dollars, more investment, community health centers will see more patients and be able to lean deeper in, build more of the services that their communities need. Mm. Yeah, but for numbers, um, 64% is from patient revenue. And so that's a pretty big number. And then, you know, just the, the federal grant is only 12% across all the health centers. So, you know, it right now patient revenue is really the the one that's driving that and as Rochelle said um you know I think the state and local grants are are, are grants that are not um tied to patient revenue can also help with that kind of innovative care model or being able to um pay more uh providers more or get um different services in so you know kind of that mix is going to be important to look at going forward well, and you touched a little bit about the investment of a dollar that so the that money going to a community health center, if someone's getting something taken care of there preventatively, it's keeping them out mm-hmm. of the emergency Absolutely. room. Well, and not, not to make it like about a financial thing, it's making people more healthy, yep. you know, so, but if you want to look at the financial picture, like. Which is important. It's a, you know, we always have to think about risks and rewards and, you know, benefits of, of any funding decision, or any policy decision. So keeping somebody out of an emergency room not only makes good health sense, it makes good financial sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you, well, this is like, well, I, maybe we should explain like, so one of the things that um, WIPCA does is they hold um, meetings every once in a while. So I got to travel out of my area. I am visiting another community health center, Scenic Bluffs. Thank you very much for having us. It's wonderful to be here. 
Um, in beautiful Cashton, Wisconsin. Yeah, gorgeous yes. drive over. Yes. yes, come to the Driftless. If you're just looking for a gorgeous drive, want to see the bluffs, it is amazing here. It, I agree. And and this health center in particular um, serves a lot of the Amish population in this community. A good example of how a health center is really meeting a community with what their specific needs are. Mm-hmm. Cool. Which what, one of the th- we, so we took a tour and they have a horse barn here. So that I was like. Uh, you do what? Like right. We, uh, I know no North Lakes Community Clinic clinic has a horse barn, but they no, do be, because that is um, helping them access care. That's right. That population. And that's that's pretty neat. Look, yes. I'll put a I will maybe put a picture up uh, in the notes. Oh, so I, I hope it. you do. Jeremy. Did you get it with the buggy in it? I had there is no buggy. <sighs> Which, you know, which I think might be a HIPAA violation because if you like saw, I, I don't know, our buggies so unique that it's so-and-so's buggy was there. So they're receiving. I don't know that. if they have license plates. Right. But I mean, we wouldn't put up anyway. So <laughs> one thing. The, well, so the reason we're here or the reason that we one special reason I wanted to talk to the two of you is because we'll be celebrating um, National Health Center Week. Um, That's right. Yay. August. What is National Health Center Week? National Health Center Week is coming up August 6th through 10th and is really an opportunity to shine a light on the amazing work of community health centers in their community. So it's just a way for across the nation, different community health centers in various ways, whether it's through community picnics or employee appreciation events, or here they're going to have a e-recycling event where people can bring in their old computers and safely get them wiped um, as a just a community benefit. It's just this way to really embrace the work of community health centers and the patients that they serve. So there will be events across the whole state and across the whole nation. So if you want to go travel somewhere to a National Health Center Week event, you could. Um, but it's that great chance to highlight the work of community health centers. So there'll be media, there'll be um, sometimes the governor makes visits at health centers during that week. I'll try to travel around the state to see the mm-hmm. awesome work that's happening in those local communities. Awesome. And if somebody wants to learn a little bit more about WIPCO, what could they do? Do you have a website you want to share? Or oh, I would else? surely encourage you to go to www.wphca.org. You'll see a map of all of the health centers in Wisconsin. You'll also see some of our policy and advocacy tools, our contact information. Uh, We would encourage you to stop by. Thanks for being here, the two of you. It's always a pleasure to be around you. Thank you so much for what you do for not only for North Lakes, but for all the people of Wisconsin. But I do have one last question for each of you. Um, What is in your car right now? Wow. Well, it is summer in Wisconsin. So in my vehicle right now is my kayak paddle, my life vest, my life vest for my dog. We are hoping to get out for a sunset paddle this weekend. Excellent. Um, Mine is uh, two buckets of softball, softballs, a cricket bat, lots of chairs and um, dog hair, dog hair everywhere. And I saw recently that the Madison Cricket League that Sashi participates in got some recent media attention. So if you want to learn more about cricket, check out some recent focus on the Madison Cricket League. Is there a link you can send me? I can send you a link. Oh, we'll include that. (laughs) Excellent. Um, Sashi Gregory, Rochelle Andre, thank you so much for being here and everything you do for community health centers in the state of Wisconsin. It's so great to have you on the North Lakes podcast. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. All Thanks. right. Drive safe. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. 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 Wow. I know that I'm biased because I'm an employee of a community health center, but what a great conversation. Thank you, Rochelle and Sashi, for painting the broader picture of community health centers in Wisconsin and the nation. What a great way to recognize National Health Center Week. You can learn more about an event that could be happening near you by going to nationalhealthcenterweek.org. There will also be a link to that in our show notes. The North Lakes Podcast is produced by North Lakes Community Clinic, a community health center located mostly in the northern part of Wisconsin. Our mission is to respond to the health care needs of our communities with an integrated array of quality services and actively remove barriers to wellness. Learn more on our website at nlccwi.org. My name is Jeremy Oswald. Thank you so much for listening to the North Lakes podcast. I encourage you to subscribe to this so you never miss a moment. Have a great day.